Welcome to Prepping for Winter. This is a new, in-depth analysis of the Winds of Winter sample chapters. In preparation for the release of the Winds of Winter, we'll be going line by line through the sample chapters to figure out where we are in the story and where Winds of Winter might take us. If you'd like to read the sample chapters, Angry GOT Fan has compiled them. I've left a link below. But we'll also be reading them here, line by line, and analyzing them like some sort of insane person. So let's begin with Theon 1. When we last left Theon, he and Jane Poole had safely made it to Stannis' camp with the Bravosi banker Tycho Nestoris and six Ironborn. And there they run into Asha. Now this is a callback to Asha's ruse as Esgred in A Clash of Kings. Asha does not recognize her brother, just as Theon did not recognize her. And so we begin. Theon. Now just as with the last chapter of A Dance with Dragons, Theon is himself again. Several characters in our story have lost themselves, and so did Theon, but now he is found. Now, although this is a Theon chapter, it actually mostly follows the events of the last Asha chapter, The Sacrifice. So reviewing that chapter is pretty helpful when approaching this one. The king's voice was choked with anger. Now, interestingly, we open with Theon knowing the voice of the person talking. He knows that it's Stannis. This is fascinating as Theon has a serious memory problem. Remember, when Theon made it to the Iron Isles, he forgot what his sister looked like. Even worse, he foolishly dressed himself in the clothing of a Greenlander with jewelry he paid for with the gold price. That's like traveling to Saudi Arabia and cooking up a BLT. Later on, as Reek, Theon would see lords that he had clearly met before, but completely forgot who they were. In this scene, we see an awakening of Theon's memory. Keep in mind, Theon last met Stannis when he was 10. This was when the Ironborn Rebellion was put down and Theon was shipped off to Winterfell. Theon had forgotten the face of his sister, but somehow he remembers the voice of Stannis. You are a worse pirate than Salador San. Here Stannis is angry at Tycho for bargaining so hard. Of course, this really tells us more about Stannis than it does about Tycho. Salador San was always asking for plunder, but Stannis never paid San anything in the end. Stannis is no Lannister and feels no obligation to pay people for any of their services. However, I will say that everyone describes Tycho Nestoris as a great bargainer, great to the point that he enrages everyone around him. Now, I will say that there is another George R. R. Martin story called Tough Voyaging, where the main character is a fantastic bargainer, but he is aided by a telepathic cat. Now, we have no evidence that Tycho is aided by anything telepathic or magical, but that sort of thing would not surprise me at all. Now, it's most interesting that Tycho is even loaning Stannis anything, let alone a large amount of money, considering that Stannis' cause appears to be doomed. Almost the entire sacrifice chapter was dedicated to painting the Stannis cause as pretty much hopeless. And yet here Tycho is loaning money to Stannis. He appears to know something that we the readers do not. Theon Greyjoy opened his eyes. His shoulders were on fire and he could not move his hands. For half a heartbeat, he feared he was back in his old cell, under the Dreadfort, that the jumble of memories inside his head was no more than the residue of some fever dream. I was asleep, he realized, that or passed out from the pain. When he tried to move, he swung from side to side, his back scraping against stone. He was hanging from a wall inside a tower, his wrists chained to a pair of rusted iron rings. And here we find a plot twist with Theon's condition. When we last saw Theon, we assumed him safe, but now we find him in chains. Completely new, unexpected conditions are a general theme for these sample chapters. Arya, Sansa, Aeron, and Ariana are all not where anyone could have guessed them to be, really. Now, here we are told more explicitly that Theon's memories are a jumble, and I would argue that they were jumbled way before he was captured by Ramsay. We are also reminded of Theon's time in the Dreadfort, which may come into play later on. Now, interestingly, Theon is in chains, and the big question is why? Theon is not really a danger to anyone, and Theon cannot exactly run anywhere. It's a blizzard. Meanwhile, Asha is allowed to wander despite being a prisoner. It seems to me that Stannis is keeping Theon chained up for Theon's safety, and not because he fears Theon will escape. Many Northmen want him dead, but Theon is a massively valuable prisoner for a number of reasons. Yes, the Northmen want justice and the Queen's men want to sacrifice, but Asha also wants Theon to annul the King's moot. Also, Theon is valuable because he knows intel inside Winterfell, and he also knows Winterfell as a castle, and he also knows the Dreadfort as a castle. Theon is also like a son to Dagmar Clefjaw, who holds Torrens Square. Additionally, Theon would be useful in a trade considering his mother's family 
holds the Glover's children, and in general, Theon would be useful as a puppet for Ironborn support. Considering how massively valuable Theon is, it doesn't seem likely that Stannis is actually going to sacrifice him. The air reeked of burning peat, the floor was hard-packed dirt, wooden steps spiraled up inside the walls to the roof. He saw no windows. The tower was dank, dark, and comfortless, its only furnishings a high-backed chair and a scarred table resting on three trestles. No privy was in evidence, though Theon saw a chamber pot in one shadowed alcove. The only light came from the candles on the table. His feet dangled six feet off the floor. So here we find that Stannis has made his headquarters a tower in the middle of the crofter's village. Asha states in the Sacrifice chapter that Stannis doesn't leave this tower for days at a time. The room actually speaks a lot about Stannis. Note that there's only one chair. This means that Stannis is not conferring or discussing anything with anyone else in his army. Or if he is, it's not for very long. Additionally, there's no bed. If Stannis is sleeping, it's either in that chair or on the floor. However, it may be that he's not sleeping at all. In Melisandre's point of view chapter, we find out that she doesn't sleep much. Stannis may be following Melisandre in this regard. The wooden steps that Theon sees go up to the roof to the beacon fire atop the tower. Asha and others think Stannis is staring into this fire for insight or direction, or perhaps talking to Melisandre. However, I will say that Asha says that Stannis is only up there from time to time, so really this means that the lion's share of Stannis' time must be spent sitting at that table alone. But doing what? Thinking? Planning? Stannis is supposedly the best military mind in our story, and he marched an army to Winterfell and waited at this crofter's village for 19 days. He seems to be planning something big, but what? Now it's important to note that Stannis has been mostly alone for his time in this crofter's village, but now he has opted to hang Theon in a rather Christ-like position in his tower. We know that Stannis likes his privacy. After all, he spent 19 days mostly alone. There must be a good reason for having Theon there. As I mentioned earlier, Theon is objectively very valuable. It seems whatever Stannis is planning, Theon is part of it. My brother's debts, the king was muttering. Joffrey's too, though that base-born abomination was no kin to me. So Stannis, more than anyone else in our story, is offended by children born of incest and calls them abominations. His letter announcing Cersei's incest uses the term, his followers use the term, and he uses the term on Gilly's baby. A few other things are called abominations in our story. Slavery, cannibalism, the black goat of Kohor. But the word abomination is highlighted quite a bit in the Dance with Dragons prologue, where we learn that the worst abomination is warging other humans. Now Stannis is using the term to refer to Joffrey, but I can't help but think about Varamyr Sixskins and Bran when I hear the use of the word abomination. And as it turns out, Bran is lurking in this chapter. Theon twisted in his chains. He knew that voice. Stannis. Theon chortled. A stab of pain went up his arms, from his shoulders to his wrists. All he had done, all he had suffered, Moat Caelan and Barrowton and Winterfell, Abel and his washerwomen, crow food and his umbers, the trek through the snows, all of it had only served to exchange one tormentor for another. So Theon notes his return to being a hostage, and really this is Theon's whole life, from Ned Stark to Ramsay Bolton to Stannis. Here Theon makes note of Stannis and Ramsay, but he leaves out Ned Stark. And here I question whether or not Theon really felt tormented as a ward at Winterfell. He certainly claims it was a bad time, but at the same time, he also claims he wanted to be a Stark. Anyway, we're also quite clearly told that Theon knows the voice of Stannis, a voice he would have known from the beginning of his imprisonment with Ned Stark. Now one may question whether or not Theon is remembering Stannis from when he was 10, or just from earlier. Perhaps Theon actually met Stannis in between the Sacrifice chapter and Theon won the Winds of Winter. Perhaps, it's actually really hard to say. Theon acts like waking up to Stannis is their first meeting, and a discovery of himself in the tower. However, later Theon starts remembering that knights had been coming and going throughout the night. So yes, it's entirely possible that Theon met Stannis hours earlier and had already forgotten. Though I personally think remembering him from his childhood makes a much better story. In the end though, the point is the same. Theon's memory is all screwed up. Your grace, a second voice said softly. Pardon, but your ink has frozen. The Bravosi, Theon knew. What was his name? Tycho? Tycho something? Perhaps a bit of heat. So Theon has been traveling with Tycho Nestoris for three days and somehow has forgotten his name. 
Tycho even introduced himself to Asha right in front of Theon. Theon just has a screwy, screwy memory. I know a quicker way. Stannis drew his dagger. For an instant, Theon thought he meant to stab the banker. You will not get a drop of blood from that one, my lord, he might have told him. The king laid the blade of the knife against the ball of his left thumb and slashed. There, I will sign in my own blood. That ought to make your masters happy. If it please your grace, it will please the Iron Bank. Stannis dipped a quill in the blood welling from his thumb and scratched his name across the piece of parchment. So here Stannis decides to sign his contract in blood. This is a funny little act. I guess Stannis is trying to show his disdain for Tycho and the bank, or perhaps his commitment, or maybe he really thinks it's more practical than simply putting the inkwell over a candle. It's hard to say. Obviously it's reminiscent of deals with the devil that are signed in blood. I guess the Iron Bank could be seen as some big evil organization, but honestly, compared to the other things we've seen in the story, they really don't come off as that menacing yet. Now Theon makes a comment about Tycho not giving blood, so for some reason Theon knows the banker to be a hard bargainer. I'm not sure who Tycho was bargaining with for Theon to observe this. Theon? Mors Umber? Christopher Botley? And over what? Now interestingly, in Theon's head, he actually refers to Stannis as my lord instead of your grace. Speaking to Stannis, he's actually very careful to always use your grace. But for a moment, we get Theon's true opinion of Stannis' status. You will depart today. Lord Bolton may be on us soon. I will not have you caught up in the fighting. That would be my preference as well. The Bravosi slipped the roll of parchment inside a wooden tube. I hope to have the honor of calling on you, your grace, again when you are seated on the Iron Throne. Now here Stannis reveals that he knows that the Bolton forces are coming, but how he knows this information is still in question. Certainly Tycho Nestoris would have let Stannis know this, but Tycho just arrived. Stannis has been mysteriously sitting in the crofter's village for 19 days. This points to the idea that Stannis knew the Bolton forces were coming much earlier. But how on earth did he know this? The Boltons are in a winning position inside Winterfell. They really just needed to sit there and let Stannis freeze and starve. It's inner turmoil and perhaps the escape of Theon and fake Arya that changed that. And this is where we get into the idea that Stannis knew about and caused the events inside Winterfell. Could he be cooperating with the likes of Mance Raider, Moore's Umber, and Wyman Manderly? These are the men that caused the Winterfell commotion. But how did Stannis coordinate with these men when he was on his long march? Or did he simply plan everything from the beginning? You hope to have your gold, you mean. Save your pleasantries. It is coin I need from Bravos, not empty courtesy. Tell the guard outside I have need of Justin Massey. It would be my pleasure. The Iron Bank is always glad to be of service. The banker bowed. As he left, another entered. A knight. The king's knights have been coming and going all night, Theon recalled dimly. This one seemed to be the king's familiar. Lean, dark-haired, hard-eyed, his face marred by pockmarks and old scars. He wore a faded surcoat embroidered with three moths. Now here we hear about Stannis' two most loyal knights, Justin Massey and Richard Horp. Horp is the one with the three moths on his surcoat. These two are paired together often in our story. Both recommended retreat to Stannis at the Blackwater, both are ambitious and hoped for Winterfell, both went on a secret mission south in a dance with dragons where Jon dubbed them the Wrong Way Rangers. Incidentally, my guess is they went to recruit Moore's Umber and to get information on the North's geography on that mission. But these two knights, Massey and Horp, are completely opposite in personality. Stannis calls Massey the Smiler and Horp the Slayer. Now we learn quite a bit about Justin Massey during the King's Prize and Sacrifice chapter as he spends time trying to court Asha. We discover that Massey is losing faith in Stannis' cause and isn't really that devoted to R'hllor. Richard Horp, though, seems loyal and brutal to the bone, as well as being a true Queen's man. Now Theon is observant enough to figure out that Horp is Stannis' second in command. He even refers to Horp as Stannis' familiar. This is actually a clever play on words. A familiar is a close associate, but it's also an animal that follows around a witch. Now interestingly, Theon now dimly remembers that knights have been coming and going all night, which is at odds with Theon waking up a moment ago and discovering his position. All of this again points to Theon's crazy, crazy memory. Sire, he announced, the maester is without, and Lord Arnolf sends word that he would be most pleased to break his fast with you. The son as well? And the grandsons. 
So it here it seems Stannis has requested Maester Tybald to be brought before him, and it also seems he has requested to have breakfast with the Karstarks, the whole family, so none are left to command their forces. Now what's interesting is that Stannis has requested these men before interrogating Theon. Yes, Stannis may have information on the Karstarks' treachery from a letter from Jon, carried by Tycho, but Jon didn't know about the Maester, and knowing about the Maester kind of outs the Karstarks anyway. If Stannis already knew about Maester Tybald, he didn't really need Jon's letter. Anyway, the big question is, how did Stannis know about Tybald? Lord Wool seeks an audience as well. He wants... I know what he wants. The king indicated Theon. Him. Wool wants him dead. Flint, Nori, all of them will want him dead. For the boys he slew. Vengeance for their precious Ned. So we find out that one of the Hill Clans wants to speak with Stannis, and Stannis claims it's because they want Theon killed. Of course, Stannis cuts Horp off, so we don't actually know if it's true. He may just be trying to scare Theon. In fact, that seems quite possible. It's a bit odd that the Hill Clans would know that Theon is even here when the Karstarks do not. I suppose Stannis could have sent men to inform the Hill Clans that Theon was here, but why would he do that considering gossip could get back to the Karstarks? It seems quite likely that the Wolves wanted something completely different, and didn't even know Theon was here yet. Now it is funny that Stannis lists the Hill Clans that want Theon dead, supposedly. Wool, Flint, Nori. But Stannis leaves out Little. Of course, House Little knows Theon didn't kill Bran, as they took in Bran as he traveled north. We aren't sure if Stannis knows if Bran and Rickon are alive, and we aren't sure if House Little has told anyone. Perhaps it's just a coincidence that Stannis left the Littles off the list, but it is awfully interesting. Will you oblige them? Just now the Turncloak is more used to me alive. He has knowledge we may need. Bring in this maester. The king plucked a parchment off the table and squinted over it. A letter Theon knew. Its broken seal was black wax, hard and shiny. I know what that says, he thought, giggling. Now this is all very curious. The letter that Stannis reads is clearly the letter from Jon warning Stannis that the Karstarks are traitors. However, Stannis is calling for the maester that was with the Karstarks, who is really the Dreadfort's maester. Now, Jon didn't know anything about this maester switch, so that information would not be in the letter. So, I'm not certain why Stannis is reviewing this letter before meeting the maester. Maybe he's just reviewing it for his Karstark meeting that he's going to have later. Now, weirdly, Theon giggles and claims he knows what's in the letter. Now, yes, Theon knows about the Karstark betrayal, but he wouldn't know that Jon knows about the Karstark betrayal. Unless, that is, Tycho Nestoris told Theon. So I guess despite forgetting Tycho's name, Theon did discuss things a bit with Tycho on his three-day journey. And I guess that would explain why Theon knows that Tycho is a good bargainer. Stannis looked up. The Turncloak stirs. Theon! My name is Theon. He had to remember his name. I know your name. I know what you did. Now, remembering that his name was Reek was a mantra that Theon would repeat to himself when he was being abused by Ramsay. Rather than repeatedly insisting that he needs to remember that he's Reek, he now repeatedly remembers that he's Theon. Now, Theon picks up this mantra after he prays to the old gods at Winterfell. So I do wonder if Theon has traded one master for another and now has loyalty to the old gods. Now, weirdly, Stannis claims that he knows what Theon did. But what does he mean by that? Does he mean he knows Theon killed Bran and Rickon? Or does he mean he knows that Theon didn't kill Bran and Rickon and replace them with Miller's boys? Or does he mean he knows that one of the Miller's boys might be Theon's and that Theon might have killed his own son? In all honesty, the third one makes the most sense. Stannis says, I know what you did, as if he has some sort of insider information, and he also says it as if it's a threat. However, everyone in the world thinks that Theon killed Bran and Rickon. And revealing that he knows that Theon didn't kill Bran and Rickon would be almost the opposite of a threat. Revealing that he knows that Theon is a kinslayer is actually the most intimidating thing he could say. And Moore's Umber did seem to think that Theon was a kinslayer as well, so the information could have easily passed to Stannis. I saved her! The outer wall of Winterfell was 80 feet high, but beneath the spot where he had jumped, the snows had piled up to a depth of more than 40. A cold white pillow... The girl had taken the worst of it. Jane. Her name is Jane. But she will never tell them. Theon had landed on top of her and broken some of her ribs. I saved the girl, he said. Now Theon landing on top of Jane and breaking her ribs is probably a play on the classic tales of saving the damsel in distress. 
In this story, though, the hero is no hero, and the damsel is no maid, and the damsel doesn't fare too well. I do also feel that the author is making a comment about the status of women with Jane Poole. Jane has no rights and is nothing but an object to those around her. A whore, then an object to steal Winterfell with, then a way to create dissent within Winterfell, and finally a cushion for Theon's fall. It's kind of ironic that Theon, after using Jane to break his fall literally, is trying to use Jane to break his fall figuratively with Stannis. We flew! Stannis snorted. You fell! If Morris Crowfoot and his men had not been outside the castle, Bolton would have had the both of you back in moments. So here we explore the difference between flying and falling, which is a reoccurring theme in our story. If you remember, one of Bran's earliest dreams has him talking about the difference between falling and flying with the Thread Crow. And Sweet Robin talks about people flying even though they're only falling out the moon door. Now interestingly, Stannis is downplaying Theon's role in the rescue of fake Arya. It seems he doesn't want to owe Theon anything and wants Theon vulnerable for his interrogation of him. I will say it's a rather remarkable coincidence that the Umber men were outside the castle right where Theon fell. This seems to support the idea that there was a conspiracy to get fake Arya out that involved Mance Raider, the Manderleys, and the Umbers. After all, how did Mance and his crew know to jump off in the exact place where 40 feet of snow had piled up? They would need eyes on the outside. Anyway, that's all for now. We'll continue this read and analysis later on in Theon 1 Part 2.